Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Paul's on this beautiful, warm Sunday. We get to praise God once again. We are in Epiphany looking at things getting revealed, and today we're going to see that reactions are revealed. So when somebody does evil to us, we instead love them back. And so that's what God wants us to do. We'll celebrate, continue to do so, God's love here in this service today. We'll also receive God's love in the form of the sacrament today. So prepare your minds and hearts to receive the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Excuse me. Just a couple of reminders about communion. Uh, First of all, when you come up for communion and you receive the wafer, I ask that you, you put your hand out like this. I'll place the wafer there in your hand and you can feed the wafer to yourself. Uh, If you're not able to do that, then just lift your head up and I'll place it in your mouth for you. Uh, When it comes to the communion cup, we won't place them in the holes anymore. They are disposable, so we'll have you put them and deposit them in the baskets on your way back to your seats. With all of that said, let's begin our worship here. We're going to worship here, first of all, with him 490. Love in Christ is strong and living. May God bless your worship today. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We ask for God's continued mercy. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, For patience and perseverance in this life, 
that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, keep your family, the church, always faithful to you, that we may lean on the hope of your promises and be strong in the power of your love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson for today shows us what God's love can do in hearts. It comes from Genesis chapter 45. This will also serve as the sermon text for today. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not answer him because they were terrified by his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me, please. They came closer. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be upset or angry with yourselves for selling me to this place, since God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For two years now the famine has been in the land, and there are still five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you as survivors on the earth and to keep you alive by a great act of deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He kissed all his brothers and wept over them. After that, his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. The second lesson comes from Romans chapter 12, where we receive a good reminder from Paul of what to repay evil with. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Weep with those who are weeping. Have the same respect for one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the humble. Do not think too highly of yourselves. Do not pay anyone back evil for evil. Focus on those things that everyone considers noble. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, maintain peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. The verse of the day comes from Luke chapter 6. We speak it together. Alleluia. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Alleluia. Now please stand in honor of the gospel. The gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 6. We receive here Jesus' own commands. But I say to you, to you who are listening, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek... Offer the other too. If someone takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes away your things, do not demand them back. Treat others just as you would want them to treat you. 
If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? To be sure, even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners do the same thing. If you lend to those from whom you expect to be repaid, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners lend to sitters in order to be paid back in full. Instead, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. In fact, the me measure with which you measure will be measured back to you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, Son of God, Eternal Savior, number 492.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the one who loved us so much that he sent us his one and only Son. Amen. Sermon text for today comes from the first lesson. If you'd like to follow along, let us pray. O oh Lord, open our minds and our hearts to your word so that we can see your great love for people. Amen. I hate you. You wronged me. You were selfish. You were evil. You ruined my life. Now you're going to get punished. And you're going to rot. And I am going to sit back and enjoy every minute of it. That's what Joseph could have said. But thanks be to God, we have a different lesson before us thanks to his grace today. You and I are sinners, and we live in a world full of sinners. And we're going to face many times when people hurt us and wrong us. And so today, we take a look at a lesson that God gives us in the life of Joseph. We get to see how God guided Joseph to recognize his role in what he could do for his enemies. And therefore, instead, Joseph said, God sent me to preserve life. In Genesis chapter 45, we are at the height of the account of Joseph. If you get a chance this week, I recommend you sit down and you read chapters 37 to 44 of Genesis. That will give you all the details of what Joseph went through. Joseph was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers into Egypt. He was a slave for 13 years. He eventually worked his way up to be second in command for his master when all of a sudden he was falsely accused and sent to prison. There in prison, there was a man who was close to Pharaoh that Joseph helped out, and he said, Remember me? And the man forgot about him. Two years later, Joseph was given the opportunity to interpret one of Pharaoh's dreams. He interpreted it as seven years of plenty upon the land, followed by seven years of severe famine. The Pharaoh loved it so much, he made Joseph second in command to take care of the country so that everybody would have enough food. Quite the rags-to-riches story. But it wasn't without its pain and agony. Joseph had to suffer for 13 years, wondering why he was a slave. He had to wonder how his brothers could do such a thing to him. Imagine the anger and the resentment. And sure enough, his dreams come true, or the interpretations of Pharaoh's dreams. And so lo and behold, who comes into Egypt to buy food? But his own brothers, who had sold him into slavery now 22 years earlier. If you were in Joseph's position and you saw your brothers walk into town, what would you do? Ah, ha! Brothers, I am the one you sold into Egypt, and now look at me, I'm second in command. Kneel before me, you better run and hide, actually, because I am going to bring punishment upon you. You're going to get what you deserve. You and I actually can, can act like that, or have that kind of attitude in our hearts. And we go through a fraction of the pain that Joseph went through. Sometimes when someone hurts us or wrongs us, we can actually think to ourselves, I hope you get what's coming to you. We can fail to forgive. We can think, I'm not going to forgive them. They don't deserve it. We might even hope that some evil befalls them. We might even pray for it. You and I can be pretty unforgiving with our enemies sometimes. 
And you and I can gather enemies from all parts of our lives. We can have enemies that we have that are long-term enemies where we've held on to long-term grudges. Or we can have just momentary enemies, maybe somebody who cuts us off on the road. We can have enemies that we've never met before, complete strangers. We can have enemies that are in our own households. We can have enemies that are unbelievers. We can have enemies that are even members of our own faith, maybe even members of our own church. And with all of these enemies, sometimes you and I can completely forget Jesus' command. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Instead, we can return the hatred, the mistreatment, the cursing. We might even feel okay with it and happy about it. We can tell them in a way, I hate you, you wronged me, now you're going to be punished and you're going to rot and I'm going to sit back and enjoy every minute of it. When we do that, we're failing to recognize the role to which we have been called to fulfill. After 22 years of all the resentment and the wonder of how his brothers could do this, including 13 years as a slave or in prison, God guided Joseph to realize two things. One, what he could do in the hearts of people. And also Joseph's role in what he could do for those people, even his enemies. So there they are. They show up in town, and Joseph has all of these emotions going through him, as you can understand, with all of those 22 years. And so he tests them, actually. He wants to see, are they still the same hateful, selfish people? But each time, they prove that they're not. They actually are remorseful, even self-sacrificing. Joseph was able to see what God could do in the hearts of even his stubborn brothers, and if God was willing to do that for his brothers, who was Joseph to deny them that? So finally, Joseph can't hide who he is anymore. He tells everybody to leave except for his brothers. He even tells the interpreters that he had been speaking through to leave up until that point. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers could not answer him because they were terrified by his presence. Imagine what it was like for his brothers in that moment. You thought for 22 years that your brother was dead or at least a slave somewhere. And now this man you thought was an Egyptian tells you that he is Joseph in your own language. And he says that his father is their father. It couldn't be. If it was, they were in trouble. They knew the evil that they had done to him, and so they were sitting there, petrified, not knowing what to do. Sensing this, Joseph says, Come closer to me, please. They came closer. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Only Joseph could know that. And Joseph could have said, you better run and hide, brothers. Instead, he says the opposite. He says, come closer to me. Joseph there reflecting the heart of his God. Joseph there showing that he knew what his God was all about and what his family was all about. See, Joseph knew that God could say to every single human being, yes, even righteous Joseph, I hate you, you wronged me, you deserve to be punished, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy it. God could have said that to every one of us, and yet God was going to say that to a Savior who was going to come through his family line. Joseph knew the promises to his forefathers. He knew Abraham was given that promise, passed through Isaac, and then his father Jacob. All nations on earth would be blessed through them. He knew that there was someone going to come. He only knew the name as the offspring. 
You and I know him as Jesus. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled exactly the faith that Joseph had, the hope that he would take upon himself all the agony, more than 13 years of agony, 22 years of agony, an eternity of agony. Jesus took all of that for all of God's natural-born enemies, you and me. Through Jesus, God was going to say, don't run and hide, but come closer to me. That is his forgiving love, not just for Joseph, but also for his brothers and for everyone. Joseph recognized that, and he didn't just recognize that. He recognized his role in bringing that forgiveness to other people, even his brothers. Now, I'm about to read Joseph's response and what he says to his brothers. And as I do that, I want you to think, where is Joseph's focus? How does he see his role between God and his brothers? Now, do not be upset or angry with yourselves for selling me to this place, since God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For two years now, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you as survivors on the earth and to keep you alive by a great act of deliverance. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. Where was Joseph's focus? It wasn't on himself. It wasn't on his anger or resentment, the revenge he could have taken. You notice all the yous? His focus was completely on his brothers. He knew God sent him to save and preserve the lives of the men who had treated his life like garbage. God put him in that position. And Joseph gloried in that grace, gloried that God would give him the opportunity to be facilitator of that grace. And not just to his brothers. Joseph knew that by preserving a remnant of his family line, he was actually preserving the Savior of the world and the promise. So by doing these things, recognizing this contentious situation God put him in, he was actually helping to bring the salvation of the world. He was helping bring forgiveness to you and to everyone. What a humbling thought. And that was his role, facilitator of God's grace. Now, you and I might not be able to facilitate the salvation of the world. It's already been secured. But that doesn't mean you can't facilitate grace to somebody's world, to them, to their family. You and I are here on this earth still so that we can be facilitators of God's grace to others, even our enemies. In fact, those are prime situations for God to show his grace, aren't they? God doesn't like sin. He doesn't like these contentious situations. But look at what he's able to do with them. He is able to make them into great examples of his grace. And he does that through you and me. That means instead of that long-held grudge and giving into anger and resentment, you and I, in those moments, are able to show just how powerful God's reconciling love can be. That means instead of that momentary enemy that we have, we can actually use that to show the patience and love of Jesus. It stands out. Instead of that spat that you have with your spouse or your kids, you actually can now forgive each other and come closer together, not just with your family, but also with God. Instead of bristling when you hear the voice of that person that you really don't get along with, you can see it as an opportunity now to show them some grace that maybe they need. You and I get to be facilitators to all of people, especially our enemies. Now, when that happens, usually in the moment, we come up with a couple of prime excuses. Sometimes they're excuses. Sometimes we actually think they're legitimate, but we prevent ourselves from showing love. The first one is that God couldn't possibly mend this situation. He couldn't fix this relationship. If you think that, I now invite you to take a look at Joseph and his brothers. 
In Genesis 37, this is what we heard about his brothers. Filled with jealousy, they hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word to him. Then Joseph was in slavery for 13 years, gone for 22. And then we hear this at the end of the account. After Joseph revealed himself, Joseph kissed all his brothers and wept over them. After that, his brothers talked with him. It seems like this weird sentence, his brothers talked with him. But that was calling back to Genesis 37. Look at what God is able to do with any type of situation. Look at this relationship. And from there, you and I come up with a different excuse. We think, well, even if, you know, sometimes they're probably just going to throw my words out the window. And they might. They might take your forgiveness and not even care. You might treat them with grace. And you might never get that grace back. They might still see you as an enemy. But you know what? It's not our job to bring forth fruit from God's grace. That's not our role. Our role is to be a facilitator of God's grace. He's the one that brings forth the fruit. We leave that to him. You and I, in any situation, any relationship, can show the forgiving, reconciling love and grace of God. And that can repair any relationship. Just look at us with God. That means that with all of this, really that command, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, and not only seems easier, but it actually is given its glorious purpose then. You realize what God can do in those moments through you. You have a significant role. And in those moments, along with Joseph, you can say, God sent me to preserve life. Amen. Please stand. May God guard your hearts and minds through his forgiving love in Jesus. Amen. We now confess our faith according to the Nicene Creed of what Jesus did for us. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We bring forward the offering. We join together in the prayer of the church. We pray for those with health challenges, including Caius Kingston, that is the, the newborn son of Cassie Kingston, that's Pet, Betsy Parr's cousin, uh, was born quite premature, so he's in the NICU. Uh, they're taking good care of him, but we're going to pray for him. We'll also pray for Marilyn Meyer, uh, who went to the hospital and will have surgery for gallstones coming up this week. We also pray for Bruce Wegner, who was taken in as well, and he's doing well too, but we'll include him in our prayers. 
We include pr prayers for those celebrating anniversaries, Robert and Patricia Mankey and Robert and Sharon Schrader. We also pray for those celebrating birthdays, Andrew Loomis, Diane Coulterman, Howard Larson, Diane Thompson, Elijah Tucker, Robert Martin, Bella Langer, Lois Olson, and Marie Strick. We pray with one mind and one heart. Savior of the world, while we were still sinners, you died for us. You endured our shame on the cross and have showered us with your love. Bless us who go out into the world with your name to honor you. Spur us on to love and word and deed as graciously as you have done and always do for us. We ask you to give a rich measure of faith and hope to all of those suffering from health challenges, including Caius Kingston, Marilyn Meyer, and Bruce Wagner. Bless the work of their doctors and continue to keep them strong. Comfort the families with your love shown in the cross. Lord, please strengthen the love of all married couples, especially those celebrating anniversaries. Nourished by word and sacrament, give them a rich love for each other and a continued dedication to be loving companions. Continue to bless those who are celebrating birthdays this week. Give them a chance to see your grace on this special day and to share that grace and celebration of your providence. We pray all of these things in your saving name. Amen. Now please stand in honor of the gospel and the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, good and right, so to you. it is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came as the light of the world, so that the world may have light and life through him. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve us in the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen our lord jesus christ on the night he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Please stand. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn number 498, Though I Speak with Bravest Fire. Good morning again. Good morning. Always good with worship and word and sacrament here in this place. A few announcements for you. Uh, visitors, a big welcome to you. If you have any questions about anything, we don't bite, uh, feel free to ask. If uh, you get a chance, make sure to fill out one of those connection cards. The ushers will collect all of those as they usher you out. Bible study and Sunday school are next. Today we're looking at God's beloved son was baptized and tempted for us. So we're going to take a look at that today. We extended a principal call to Mr. Jacob Zimmerman. Uh, continue to keep him in your prayers as he deliberates that. Bible information class, that's the class for, for those interested in membership. Also, 
those who maybe want to get refreshed in the basics, which is always a good thing, uh, that's starting tomorrow at 5 p.m. down in the church basement, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Midweek Bible study is going to be a new one this week. Uh, we're going to look at the book of Zechariah. Uh, yes, we will be having midweek study through Lent. Uh, so Tuesdays, 7 p.m., Wednesdays, 9 a.m. is when we're going to have that study as always. So book of Zechariah this week. Lenten services begin March 2nd here uh, with Ash Wednesday at 7 p.m. That will be a communion service, so uh, love to see you there. After that, it'll be part of a rotation with the other pastors in the area each Wednesday at 7 p.m. until Holy Week. Church directory photos, we are going to have another day for that. Uh, so that's going to be March 15th. If you would like to be a part of that, please sign up or, or contact Sue Gulnick or Shelly Lafke, our, our secretary, if you have any questions about signing up. The Bakkens were able to secure a wheelchair accessible van for just a little bit, but if you still know of somebody who's able to help them out, please contact uh, Irene or myself. You can find her number in there and you can call the church number for me. Just a reminder once again about the connection cards. Make sure to fill those out. A reminder of how to do so is in the news and announcements. May God continue to bless you as always with his love in Jesus. Please stick around and greet one another.